Cafe pilots warned against taxiing at airports slowly and deliberately to increase flight hours and pay. Thai voters go to the polls. And in Turkey, an election that could see longtime ruler Erdogan removed from power. Good evening and welcome to TVB News. Several airports have criticized Cathay Pacific after a number of its flights taxied in a slow manner at aprons. The airline has warned its pilots that it will take disciplinary measures. Sources say the pilots intentionally lowered the taxiing speed in order to get overtime pay. Timothy Lee tells us more. TVB News managed to get hold of the Cathay Pacific digital notice that was issued to the airline's pilots. It said that Cathay had received complaints from the airport authority about the airline's planes taxiing at speeds lower than other aircraft, which in turn led to a traffic congestion. Cathay verified the information after reviewing its data and noted that its pilots were taxiing at the speed of 30 to 40 kilometers per hour. The notice warned that if a pilot is found to have intentionally done so, airline authorities will take disciplinary action. A flight tracking website showed that the usual time it takes for a plane to travel between the gate and the runway is 10 minutes, but the same journey took two Cathay flights 40 minutes to complete. Cathay Pacific did not confirm the reason for the plane's lowered taxiing speed, but some former pilots believe that pilots did that in hopes of increasing paid hours. Since Cathay's large-scale layoffs in 2020, contracts for flight crew members also received an update. Prior to the update, the paid hours of pilots were calculated by flight hours predicted by the airline. That means even if pilots arrived at their destinations early, they will not be paid less. However, under the new contract, Cathay pilots are paid by actual flight hours, as the current hourly wage for pilots are between $1,500 and $3,000, and additional half an hour spent on the apron and taxiway could add up to thousands of dollars of extra pay per flight. The airline stressed that it is taking the concerns of the airport authority and other airline-related departments seriously, adding that Cathay will increase its effort to maintain and raise the efficiency and quality of its flights. Timothy Lee, TVB News. Starting on May 1, 2025, the offsetting mechanism under the Mandatory Provident Fund, or MPF, will be abolished. Secretary for Labor and Welfare Chris Sun said the government is reviewing the designated savings account scheme and whether employers should be forced to pay related expenses. Veronica Lin has the story. On Labor Day, two years from now, the Mandatory Provident Fund's offsetting mechanism will be abolished. Currently, the mechanism allows employers to use pension funds to offset long service and severance payments. Under the government's original plan, it will put in place a 25-year scheme involving over $33 billion in subsidy to help businesses with the transition. Also, employers will have to set aside funds for a designated savings account scheme, or DSA, to pay out the severance or long service payments in the future. Secretary for Labor and Welfare Chris Song told TVB News that the government is now reviewing the DSA scheme and whether employers should be forced to pay extra. Song asked that since there is no longer low interest rates, would it be worth it to freeze the money in the DSA accounts? He added whilst long-term service payments need to be provisioned, severance fees do not. He said that the impact of the abolition of the MFP offsetting mechanism on businesses is minimal and will allow time for companies such as small and medium-sized enterprises or SMEs to adjust to such changes. The abolition arrangement is a gradual uh, arrangement, uh, gradual in the, in the sense that for all the years uh, uh, accumulated by uh, em by employees uh, before uh, 1st of May 2025, it still will be subject to an offset, set, offset arrangement. It's only the, um, the um, severance payment or long service, long service payment generated after uh, 2025, 1st of May, uh, it cannot be offset. So it's a gradual, gradual approach. Earlier this week, Song made a trip to Beijing and met with Xia Baolong, director of the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office. Song hailed it as a fruitful three-day visit. Among the key issues discussed was population aging and the elderly community in Hong Kong. 
Uh, we are right now into the aging society. So uh, in, at this moment, uh, every uh, one in five people in Hong Kong, um, they are elderly. Uh, it's increasing uh, over time. So while uh, we are making all our efforts to build uh, additional beds, additional um, um, elderly homes, uh, we're to improve um, uh, community care services. Uh, we believe we should also um, uh, make use of the uh, GBA opportunity, where land is more ample, uh, the labor supply is more sufficient uh, to offer another choice to our elderly. Sang added that while this idea is still in its early stages, he hopes the criteria for eligible elderly residents will be loosened so more can have the option to enjoy their twilight years in the Greater Bay Area. Fan Kalin, TV News. Financial Secretary Paul Chan wrote about the Kao Yi Chao Artificial Islands project in a blog post. He said a large portion of the funds will be raised through the market. Some believe this will ensure the progress of construction. More than half of Hong Kong's land supply in the next 25 years will come from the northern metropolis area and the Kao Yi Chao Artificial Islands. While the funds for the metropolis will come from $100 billion set aside in last year's budget, funding for the man-made islands will largely be raised through the market. Chan wrote that most enterprises and organizations recognize the potential of the Kao Yi Chao project and are willing to participate. Different methods of financing being suggested, such as public and private partnerships allow for greater flexibility and more options. Voters in Thailand headed for the polls today in an election touted as a pivotal chance for change. It has been more than eight years since incumbent Prime Minister Prayuth Chan Ocha came to power in a coup. He is now running against the daughter of the politician who is the military's top nemesis. Tracy Furness has more. Thais, young and old, flocked to polling stations across the country as the national election kicked off early Sunday morning. There are about 52 million eligible voters in Thailand, of which 80% were expected to cast their vote before polling closed at 5 p.m. in the afternoon. Unofficial results are expected within five hours of the polls closing, but the Prime Minister will be selected in July in a joint session of the House and the 250-seat Senate. Incumbent Prime Minister Prayut chan voted in Bangkok earlier today. I would urge all Thais who are eligible to vote to come out today, he said. Opinion polls indicate the opposition Pur Thai party headed by Pei Tong Tam Sinawak to win a healthy plurality of seats in the 500-member lower house. A member of the Shinawat political family, she is the youngest daughter and niece of former Prime Ministers Taksin Shinawat and Yingluk Shinawat, respectively. I'm in a very good mood and I'm very happy. I, even though the, the weather is quite hot, but everybody's here and thank you for that. Her party won the most seats in the lower house during the last election in 2019, but its such rival, the military-backed Palang Pracharat Party, succeeded in cobbling together a coalition with Prayut as Prime Minister. As the military still controls the 250-seat Senate, history could repeat itself even if Shinawat wins the majority of seats in the lower house again. Prayut is backed this election by the United Thai Nation Party, but his deputy, Prayut Wong Suwan, is running against him, leading the Prelang Patrath Party, which was the largest party in the previous coalition. Also running is the charismatic leader of the Move Forward Party, Peter Lima Jaranrat. The 42-year-old Harvard alumnus is banking on young people to vote for him, including 3.3 million first-time voters. He is optimistic about the turnout in this election. Hopefully it will be historical. I think last time it was about 72-ish, 73-ish percent out of like 52 or 55 million people. If, if the voting turnout is 75 percent or 80 percent, that would be all the way to the moon. Tracy Furness, TVB News. Turks are voting in an election that could see longtime ruler Recep Tayyip Erdogan removed from power. Opinion polls give Erdogan's main challenger, Kemal Kilic Duroglu, who heads an alliance of six opposition parties, a slight lead. But if either fails to get over 50 percent of the vote, there will be a runoff election on May 28th. Matthew Bray with details. This is Kemal Kilic Duroglu, the main challenger to tie up Erdogan at his final rally ahead of presidential and parliamentary elections being held today. 
He leads the secularist CHP and five other parties that are expected to garner support from the main Kurdish party as well, giving it an edge over Erdogan's Islamist-rooted AK party. Kilic Duroglu, a former civil servant, has promised to return Turkey to orthodox economic policies and a parliamentary system of governance away from his rival's top-down executive presidential system. This election is taking place three months after earthquakes in the southeast killed over 50,000 people. Many were angered at the slow response of the government and the shoddiness of buildings that caved in, but there is no clear evidence that this will change the way people vote. Erdogan is a powerful speaker and wily campaigner who has vast experience in getting his voters out. He gets fierce loyalty from pious Turks who felt disenfranchised in secular Turkey. He has seen off a coup in 2016 and a number of corruption scandals. But he faces his stiffest test now as Turks' standard of living has plummeted, inflation is rampant and the Turkish lira is as weak as they come. In order to try and win, Erdogan has increased wages and pensions and subsidized electricity and gas bills. Voters will also be casting ballots for the 600-member parliament. The opposition would need at least a majority to roll back Erdogan's democratic deficit. If they do win, expect a re-establishment of the independence of the judiciary, the central bank and a newfound tolerance for free speech. Matthew Bray, TVB News. A truce between Israel and the militant group Islamic Jihad appeared to be holding after it came into effect late Saturday. The Egyptian brokered agreement was designed to end the worst spate of cross-border violence since a 10-day conflagration in 2021. These are some of the scenes in Gaza City where Palestinians were celebrating the ceasefire. Israel launched the latest round of airstrikes on Tuesday, saying it was targeting Islamic Jihad commanders who had planned attacks in Israel. In response, the Iranian-backed group fired over a 1,000 rockets into Israel, sending civilians fleeing into bomb shelters. At least 10 people were killed in Gaza and two in Israel. Still to come on tonight's news. Ukraine's president hold talks with Pope Francis at the Vatican. New facilities at the Eastern Hospital's Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy Center. And Mother's Day celebrations in Hong Kong. Welcome back to TVB News. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky held talks with Pope Francis at the Vatican on Saturday. The pontiff had previously offered to do his best to try to end the 15-month-old war, but it's unlikely to take part in mediation. Zelensky had earlier met Italian leaders and later flew to Berlin for discussions with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Nazvi Karim has more. Great honor. With a hand to the chest and a bow, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky sat down with Pope Francis at the Vatican for talks about the war with Russia. Zelensky presented the pontiff with a bulletproof jacket used by a Ukrainian soldier imprinted with the image of the Madonna, a symbol of a 15-month war that has cost tens of thousands of lives on both sides, but which even the Pope is unable to stop after what he suspected be aborted Vatican mediation efforts. Even Zelensky is reluctant for mediation, instead reportedly asking Pope Francis to support his 10-point peace plan that calls for Russia's complete withdrawal from occupied lands and the restoration of Ukraine's borders. Zelensky said that during a 40-minute private meeting, he asked the Pope to condemn Russia. They also discussed humanitarian gestures. This likely refers to the Vatican's willingness to help in the repatriation of some 19,500 Ukrainian children Kiev says has been taken to Russia since the start of the war. During an earlier visit to Italy, Zelensky met Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney and President Sergio Mattarella. At a news conference, Maloney condemned Russia's brutal and unjust aggression and pledged Italy's continued military support for Ukraine for as long as necessary. She also backed Ukraine's bid for European Union membership and the intensification of its partnership with NATO. 
After the Vatican, Zelensky went to Berlin, where he was welcomed with military honors by German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. The visit comes just as Germany announced a new 2.7 billion euro military package to Ukraine, its biggest so far. After initial hesitance to provide Ukraine with lethal weapons, Germany is now one of Kyiv's main suppliers, including Leopard 1 and 2 main battle tanks and sophisticated air defense systems. Experts believe Zelensky will seek clarity from Scholz as to what he feels is the end game for the conflict with Russia, whether it's victory for Ukraine or simply an end to the war. Nazvi Karim, TVB News. Back locally, the Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy Center at the Pamela Yude Nethersol Eastern Hospital will add two more single-person chambers next month. It's expected to reduce the waiting time for chronic illness patients by half. During treatment, a patient will enter a chamber where the air pressure inside is raised to a level that is higher than normal. The increased air pressure will help the lungs collect more oxygen and improve the functions of white blood cells. It's also suitable for treating post-radiation therapy trauma or carbon monoxide poisoning. The hospital is the first in the city to be equipped with such a treatment facility and has served more than 6,300 patients since 2018. Apart from attracting world-class performances to the stages where East meets West, experts have suggested that the SAR government act as an agent to promote cooperation between local artists and those from the mainland and around the globe. Sakura It was at a theatrical performance that used Hong Kong as a testing ground for the play to go global. <laughs> Performing in Shanghai News, the play was invited to hit the stage in Hong Kong with bilingual subtitles after touring 60 shows since 2018. The play is based on an award-winning novel, Blossoms on the Mainland. It reveals the destinies of three young men with different family backgrounds who went through the cultural revolutions in the 1960s and the 1990s when China's economy took off. Ma Junfeng, director of the play, said performing in Hong Kong was a unique experience. He saw the city as a testing ground and a stepping stone for the play to go global. Many world-class performances have taken place on stages in Hong Kong, as the city positioned itself as an arts hub and East meets West Centre for International Cultural Exchange. A board member of the Arts Development Council suggested that the government or the Arts Development Council serve as an agency to bridge the gap between East and West by promoting more cooperation. I think we need to definitely focus on the exposure, uh, to focus on extent and also exchange. In addition to bringing them to Hong Kong uh, to, uh, for, uh, for shows, is to uh, create these opportunities, create some funding sources, create these say um, uh, um, uh, possibilities that actually we can have say local artists from Hong Kong and many artists to do something together. That is something that we can uh, leverage on Hong Kong's connection with the uh, outside world and to, uh, to bring the Chinese, uh, the mainland Chinese say, artists out to Hong Kong. I'll also suggest that the government to set up a long-term strategy in promoting Hong Kong and mainland's art and culture to the world. So Korea Ip, TVB News. Despite the rainy weather today, many were out and about celebrating Mother's Day. Mothers around town are getting all the love they deserve today. Despite the pouring rain, many flocked to the Mong Kok flower market to buy flowers for mums. Roses and carnations whispering, I love you. This father dished out $700 to purchase bouquets for six mothers. This boy said, the pink ones for my mum the red ones for my grandma, and then the others are for my helper and cousins. A shop operator told us the prices for flowers went up this time round because of the weather as well as the rising costs. Cherry expects businesses will go up by 30 percent compared to last year, adding some customers living overseas have purchased flowers from their website for their loved ones. Many also chose to enjoy this day at Chinese tea houses, especially as this is the first proper Mother's Day since the city has fully recovered from the three-year pandemic. This man said, of course we're happy. I still remember the day when the five of us couldn't sit together at a table. This operator of the tea house is confident businesses for Mother's Day this year can return to pre-pandemic levels. Still, he thinks people's spending habits have changed over the years and that they would normally get back home by 9 o'clock at night. And then, for some, it's a different kind of Mother's Day.
Under current laws, the child of an inmate who's a mother is allowed to stay with her until three years old. But this woman chose to let her family take care of her son so he could live a normal life. Still, she said it's heartbreaking each time she could only see her son for 15 minutes through the glass. The Hong Kong Correctional Services has rolled out a new initiative since last month. For each prisoner, at most two children under age three can stay with their mothers for a week at a designated facility in prison during the Lunar New Year, Easter or Christmas. This to encourage these inmates to turn over a new leaf. And that's the news. Thanks for watching.